Welcome back to Old Testament Survey. We're in the second uh, topic week uh, after spring break with our new online format. Today we're going to be talking about Samuel and David. Actually, this entire week you're going to be learning about Samuel and David, but really the lion's share of your reading and research is going to be about this person known as David, who was the first, uh, he wasn't the first king, but he's really the primary king of Israel. Uh, the readings that are assigned for this week, I want to just make sure you understand what these are. Uh, 1 Samuel, starting in chapter 1 through chapter 16, so 16 chapters of 1 Samuel. Then you pick up again in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 1, uh, through chapter 25, verse 1. And then 1 Samuel 31, verse 1, through 2 Samuel 2, 32. And then you're going to read Psalm 151, which is on page 1,689. Um, and I have the page numbers for these on a PowerPoint that you'll be finding in, uh, in this second week uh, of the new formatted class. So as we talk about Samuel and David, uh, before we get into a discussion of them, I do want to have you learn a little bit more, remind you of a few other things that we've discussed in class that are important for your learning throughout uh, the rest of the course. One of them is the interpretive grid, which we covered in class quite a bit. That is the notion uh, that God uh, created a community, uh, but, but his means of creating that community is by delivering people, uh, delivering the people of Israel into a community. And after he delivered them into a community, he blessed them with his knowledge. That is, they were blessed not just with information, but with a relationship with Yahweh, the God of Israel. And then finally, he led them into the land. And this happened through the conquest of Canaan, which we talked some about last week, which you learned about in the story of Joshua. There's two concepts that I want you to keep in mind um, as you study Samuel and David these next couple of weeks. The first one is a concept that you've heard me talk about over and over and over again, and it's the fact that the people of Israel were to be a kingdom of priests. We draw this primarily from Exodus chapter 19, 6. You've heard it a million times if you've been to class, and you're going to keep hearing it until, until we're done with this course. Uh, but remember, Israel is to be a kingdom of priests. As Levi, as the tribe of Levi, were priests to all of Israel, so Israel is to be priests to the entire world. Now, the second concept I want you to hold on to is a new one, uh, and it's going to get introduced to us pretty hardcore in, in this session. Uh, and that is that kings, uh, when we look at King Saul, King David, King Solomon, and others, kings were an accommodation by Yahweh. They were not what Yahweh originally wanted for Israel. Um, so we're going to look at the warnings that we get in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 8. And then you can also look at the warning that was given earlier than that in uh, Deuteronomy 17. But to keep this, to hold this in, in perspective, kings were not God's first plan for the people of Israel. And we'll dig into that a little bit more in just a moment. Uh, let me give you some basic facts about the book of uh, the books, two books of Samuel, really quick. First off, they were originally one book, all written in Hebrew. Uh, but when it was translated into Greek, it, they it required two scrolls because the Greek writing system is longer; it takes it has more characters. That's because, if you remember, the original Paleo Hebrew did not have vowels. So, what was one scroll in the Hebrew is actually two scrolls in Greek. Um, what we learn as we read through the books of Samuel is a, a view of the monarchy. And monarchy, of course, is a name for kingship. First off, we discover that it's warned against by Samuel. Samuel warns the people of Israel about taking for themselves a king. But then they do take a king for themselves. And that first king is a guy named Saul, S-A-U-L. And initially, Saul is very successful, but later on he fails. Uh, then we have David take over the kingship, and David is presented by and large as a positive image of the monarchy in Israel. As a matter of fact, David seems to lead Israel as a theocratic monarch. That is, he is following Yahweh God and leading the people. That doesn't mean that he didn't have some problems here and there. Now, there's some four primary characters for you to keep in mind in the book of Samuel. Samuel. 
Uh, the first person to keep in mind is Hannah. Hannah is Samuel's mother, faithful, diligent, holy woman, uh, who will remind you of other women in scripture, namely Mary, the mother of Jesus, but also some other women who had a hard time bearing children. The other primary character, another primary character that you got to remember is Samuel himself. And Samuel has two roles in the book of Samuel. First off, he's the last of the judges. All right. He connects the story of the judges with the story of the kingship. So the judges such as Ahud and Deborah and Jephthah and Gilead, uh, Samuel is essentially the last in that line of judges. The other thing is that he is the prophet to Israel. Uh, he serves that role as prophet to the people of Israel, pronouncing God's word to them. A third primary character for you to keep in mind, we've mentioned him already, is Saul. He's the first king of Israel. He is a Benjamite. Uh, and he is tall, head and shoulders, handsome, uh, winsome. Everybody loves King Saul. Uh, but King Saul ends up with some real uh, problems in his uh, rule. Uh, and then the last primary character of 1 Samuel is David, the prototypical, not the first, but the prototypical king of Israel. He's the model upon which all of the kings that follow him are supposed to follow. Now, in 2 Samuel, we have a few more characters, and I'll mention these to you rather rapidly. David, we've already talked about him. A guy named Joab, who is the leader of his military. A son named Absalom, who was rebellious against David, and rebellious for good reason. Bathsheba, I describe Bathsheba as his accidental wife. Um, and Bathsheba is also the mother of Solomon. And then there's Nathan, who is the prophet to the king of, uh, to King David. And lastly, there's Solomon, who is the true heir uh, of David's kingdom. And we'll read more about Solomon when we get into the books of First and Second Kings. Now, I want to mention this to you. There is a, a slide in the PowerPoint uh, that says, Warning, kings can be hazardous to your national health. And I have the two passages of scripture for you to keep in mind. Uh, the first one comes from Deuteronomy chapter 17, uh, verses 14 through 20. Uh, but the second one comes from 1 Samuel 8, 11 through 17. And I want to read this to you really quick. Uh, I'm going to start in verse 10 of 1 Samuel 8. You can find this if you're following along with your Bible on page 418 in the New Revised Standard. So Samuel reported all of the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen, and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his courtiers. He will take one-tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and his courtiers. He will take your male and female slaves and the best of your cattle and donkeys and put them to his work. He will take one-tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. And it continues on. It says, the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. They said, no, but we are determined to have a king over us so that we also may be like other nations. And this is one of the primary reasons that Israel chose to appoint a king over them. It's because they looked at the kingdoms around them and they all had kings, but Israel had no king. And if you remember back to the end of the book of Judges, it says there was no king in Israel and everybody did as they wanted to do. And the point, the inference that we're to draw from that is that everything that they wanted to do was evil and destructive and violated the covenant that God made with them. So the book of Judges suggests to us that having a king in Israel is a necessity. Now Deuteronomy warns against this. Uh, so Samuel prohibits it, but then God allows them, as we see here in 1 Samuel 8, to take a king for them. The book of Joshua, uh, going back just a little bit, the book of Joshua gives a positive image of Israel without a king. But then the book of Judges gives an image of Israel uh, in desperate need of a central leader. Now, David, uh, you'll discover, is a shepherd. 
He's a singer and a songwriter and a psalm writer. He's a warlord and he's a king. And we're going to cover all of that territory as you go through the book of First and Second Samuel. He's also described in First Samuel 13 as a man after God's own heart. And then this is re uh, repeated in the book of Acts in the New Testament. David is a man after God's own heart. And we need to ask ourselves why. Because David was a violent man. He killed lots of people. He took someone else's wife and then killed that man. Doesn't really sound, sound like a man after God's own heart, but we'll have to discuss. And you'll, as you read, you'll learn more and more why David is a man after God's own heart. During David, David's kingdom, uh, or David's reign, the kingdom of Israel, the territory expands greatly. So let me uh, finish up this little lecture for tonight with two little things. I want to come back to you to the story of David uh, being a man after God's own heart. And I want to tell you that story about him stealing somebody else's wife. You can read about this in 2 Samuel 11. Now, David has established himself as king over Israel. He's doing really well. And in, the chapter, in chapter 11 of 2 Samuel, again, this is on page 467, it begins, In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab with his officers and all Israel with them, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. Now, the way the story opens is that David chooses not to go out to battle like he always did. Okay, and he stays in Jerusalem and he's just hanging out, laying around, not doing anything. And he discovers a beautiful woman who is bathing on top of a roof. And he sends for her. Uh, her name is Bathsheba. She comes to David's home, uh, to the palace. Uh, and David, uh, not to put too fine a point on it, David has sex with this woman and she becomes pregnant. This was totally non-consensual. This was against her will, regardless of how she acted. The bottom line is that David seized this woman, took her for himself, and essentially raped her. He, once he discovered that she was pregnant, he invited her husband, who's fighting on the front lines, a man named Uriah, a hero in Israel. He invites him home to come and have a little furlough with his wife. And David's thought is he will spend time with his wife. They will have sex. She'll be preg uh, the, the pregnancy then can be written off as Uriah's. Well, Uriah comes in and since he's such a good man, he refuses to enjoy the comforts of home and he doesn't sleep with his wife. He sleeps on the porch and returns to battle. And David realizes that this puts him in a horrible spot. So he sends a letter back with Uriah to the front lines. And, he, and Uriah is supposed to give this letter to the commander of the army. Uriah gives the letter to the commander of the army, and Uriah goes back to the front lines to fight. And in this letter, the commander of the army is told, have Uriah fight at the worst, heaviest part of the fighting, and then pull all the people around him away so that he's going to be killed by the enemy. And that's what happened. So after Uriah was dead, David brought... Bathsheba into his home and took him as another wife. He had four. And the child that she was pregnant with died. But then the second child that David had by Bathsheba was named Solomon, who ended up being the wisest and perhaps the wealthiest king of all time. Now, David has done a horrible, horrible thing. If you're listening to this and if, you've not, if you're not familiar with the story, you might even be angry right now. I think that you should be. It's a, an appropriate response. But here's what happens in the story. Nathan the prophet comes to David, and he confronts David. And I want you to read about that in chapter 12 of 2 Samuel. So read about Nathan's confrontation with David in 2 Samuel chapter 12. It's on page 469. Needless to say, the story is really powerful, and it's very short. But needless to say, David is responsive and he repents of his wrongdoing when he's confronted by the prophet Nathan. Now, when David is described as a man after God's own heart, this is one of the reasons why. He is a man after God's own heart because his heart is responsive to God. His heart responds to God's promptings. And David repents. And other times David sings. And David worships, 
David has a heart for God. Earlier in the story, when David is uh, early on, when he's married uh, to the daughter of Saul, and he's bringing the Ark of the Covenant into the city of Jerusalem, he goes out and he dances before the Ark in a very undignified manner. And his wife, Michael, is just embarrassed for him. But David's not embarrassed because no worship, no expression of the heart is too much. No expression of the heart towards God is too obnoxious. And David's pretty obnoxious on that day. Let me finish up. Those, those, those are a couple of reasons why we think of David as being a man after God's own heart. But let me share one more uh, with you. Actually, not one more story about why David is a man after God's own heart. But I want to share one story about David's downfall. And it happens late in his reign. In 2 Samuel chapter 24, I encourage you to read that chapter. David decides to take a census, just like we're taking in the United States right now. He wants to take a census. And he, it says in the, in the text that somebody put it in his heart to take a census, to count all the people. But God did, was not pleased with this. God was not pleased with David when David decided to go out and count all the people. And I want to suggest to you one reason why God was displeased with David on this point. And this is something that David later on repents of. If you remember the passage that I read to you about Solomon, where he says he's going to take your sons and your daughters, and they'll be his footmen on his coach, and they'll be perfumers and bakers and cooks, and they'll be his soldiers, and so on and so forth. The census is David's way of consolidating power by seeking more and more control over his people, rather than trusting Yahweh to protect his people. So, when we think about the warning against kingship, David does a pretty good job of relying upon God to preserve the people of Israel. But towards the end of his story, he does do this census taking thing, which then violates the heart of, of how God desired David to trust him in leading. And as a result, David's kingdom started to crumble. That is, there's so much more to read about uh, in the life of David, and I urge you to dig into it more deeply. Uh, the story of David, there, we didn't even cover the story of Goliath. We didn't cover the story of, of him and Saul, that strange, uh, weird relationship, sad relationship. We didn't talk about his friendship with Jonathan, which is a beautiful uh, image of platonic friendship. Um, there's all kinds of other parts of this story that we just can't get into, but read it for yourself, okay? If you have any questions about the course, uh, consult the PowerPoint that is available to you this week, but also feel free to text, call, or email me, and I'll try to respond to you as quickly as possible. Good luck in your class. Uh, stay healthy.